Hallelujah. Come on. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God is good like that. It's all about Jesus. Come on. Give him a shout out, faithful our church. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because you make us brand new. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. He forgives you. He loves you. He washes you. Come on. Give it up. Another, another big hope. Applause for Jesus. Because he's good like that. Amen. God bless you. Please greet your neighbor and tell him it's nothing but the blood of Jesus that will set you free. I want to welcome you to Faithful Life Church. God bless you. God bless you. Great to have you. I'm Pastor Cindy, and this is a big, big family that you came to, and we just want to tell you God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. He makes everything brand new. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. definitely welcome everybody that's joining us online. God bless you. Remember, nothing but the blood of Jesus will set you free. Thank you for joining in with us. God bless you. God bless you. Um, I just want to, if we do have any first-time visitors here today, can you raise your hands? You if we have anybody here for the first time, God bless you. Amen. Always good to have new family. God bless you. Bienvenidos. Amen. Always good to have everybody here joining us. Y'all can be anywhere else on New Year's Eve. But you know what? Is this New Year's Eve almost? Almost. New Year's Eve extra. <laughs> if anybody knows Pastor Cindy, it's extra New Year's Eve. Tomorrow's New Year's Eve. See, I'm jumping up ahead of the game, you know. But, you know, I just, it's all good. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. It's all good. You know, huh? You know, we ain't perfect, but, you know, we're all about extra. You know, <laughs> so anyway, just definitely want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I just, I know there's quite a bit of people out of town due to, you know, Christmas and then New Year's, but that's okay because you're here. And how many of us know that the Lord is still here? How many of us know that God's got something good for us here? You know, we've just blessed everybody, even those of you that are joining us online that should be here. I'm just kidding. You're out of town and we're okay. You know, we're okay. We do miss you. We just bless you as well. But you, you do what God tells you to do and be an extension of who he is. Because anywhere you're at, he's there with you too. So amen. God bless you. God bless you again. And we just want to just share with you. If you, you first, we just want to welcome you. I'm Pastor Cindy. You should have gotten a welcome package. Am I correct? There should, you should be getting one. So you should fill out something for me. There should be a little welcome bag that you should get in there. There's a free coffee for you. And some little information. We just want to tell you thank you for visiting with us tonight. And also remember, tomorrow is Sunday service. We're still having from 2 to 5, we have Spanish, Spanglish. Because pastor doesn't know Spanish, but he ministers. He has a translator. And blessing Sergio ministers, translates in Spanish. So why, I don't want to tell you you can't come. You need to come because I tell you what, it's a different atmosphere. I tell you, it's amazing. It's not many of us. We just got started with our Spanglish service. But you know... That's my, you know, like extra, Pastor. Okay. Because, you know, they can come. Don't think it's just strictly Spanish. I'm the only one that knows Spanish in my family. You know, but Ashley's learning. Give it up for Ashley. You know, my daughter can speak Spanish, and, you know, she's, she's taught herself by the Lord, and, you know, she's doing very well. So we have our service Spanglish tomorrow from 2 to 5, or 2 to 4.30 or so. Then what we're to do we're going to go ahead because tomorrow is new year's eve tomorrow we end up releasing you after spanglish service y'all remember that okay i want you to tell me if you can find any other church that says tomorrow's our spanglish service because i can guarantee you you won't find one no one we're not an ordinary church we do things a little bit different in this house so tomorrow it'll be from two to about four about four thirty-five. then we're going to go ahead and release you and then we are having our New Year's service here. So amen. What a way to bring in the New Year's but with Jesus. Talk about making everything, making him first, even in the New Year's. So we're definitely going to do that. And we ask that you come back at 10 o'clock. 
be here. We also have cafe. We're going to have cake and ice cream. So children, make sure to tug on your parents and say, we got to go to church and get that, that, that cake and ice cream. So, but that's not the reason why they're coming, but we're going to have that as well. We're going to go ahead and just <laughs> break in the service with a fat-free cake and fat-free ice cream, Bluebell. That's a good one. <laughs> I told Pastor, I said, you know, I'm going to get some vanilla. We were talking about like the, you know, the, the vanilla that's not Bluebell. He goes, what did you say? I said, it's going to be Bluebell. He goes, right. We don't go fake in this house. It's all real. We don't pretend. So we will be having that. We do release you in, after Spanglish service, and we ask that you come back here at 10 o'clock, and then we're going to go in through the new year, and then we release you at 1. But we just know that here at Faithful Life Church, I can't give you a schedule as to what time we're going to end because God can do anything because this is his house. You just can't spend the night, but you can be here. God bless you. I love you. I want to definitely welcome Pastor. God bless you. Give it up for the man of God who's got an amazing word for you in the name of Jesus. We are going to have children class today up to the age of 12, but I ask that right now, please make sure to get your seed ready Hallelujah. and always come to the house of God with a, whether you're giving an offering or your tithe as well, FFL for any checks. We do accept credit cards, which the, the people are already doing that as well. Thank you for those of you joining us online. You can go to FFLchurch.org and click on the tab and your seed comes to the house. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord, eh? <laughs> I'm still stuck on Spanglish. Is that, is that legal or we get in trouble for that? <laughs> I deem it legal. It's legal to say Spanglish in America today. Can you give the Lord a hand, amen? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I have a word for you. But I want to open up with uh, Genesis real quick. I want to give you an opportunity to sow, so I'm going to give you a scripture. Actually, I'm going to give you two scriptures. I'm going to connect some things for you. Is that all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Are you, are you in expectation? Yes. Not, not spectator. <laughs> we never come to the house of God as a spectator. Correct. Because all you'll get is entertainment. But you'll, you'll never get fulfillment. You always got to come to the house of God expecting. In other words, you need to come in expecting God to speak to you. Expecting God to reveal himself to you. Expecting God to show himself to you. Amen? Do I have any expectators? Expectators. No, expectators. Not spectators. X. Oh my goodness! Come on, y'all. Is it cold in here? Y'all look, y'all look, y'all look shivering like I can't even talk right now. You know what I'm saying? X spectators. That means you have an expectation. You have an expectation for God ministering to to you today. You didn't hear. You're not here just to to to, to sit back like a like a football game and watch and cheer, but never go in and catch the ball yourself. Huh? That's not that's not Christianity. Oh, I said, wait, Pastor, the children are here. We should let them go. No, see, that's already a spectator. Amen expectation is no matter what, when, where, how, God's going to show up for you. Amen. I raised four children, still raising them. You know where I raised them? On the road. On the road. Ministering from place to place, traveling from place to place with four children. Expecting God to be at the next place I went to. With my children. Amen. And you the same. God will show up where you got all your children sitting right there. God will show up for you. He'll speak to you. He'll minister to you. He'll minister to them. Amen? So don't ever let your children sitting next to you be a reason or excuse not to be expecting. That should be your greatest reason to expect is for them next to you. Amen? You all right? Well, y'all got quiet on me now. Pastor. Okay, Genesis chapter on. Genesis chapter 3. Can I give you an offering scripture? Somebody say, the Lord is good. Father, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to minister to your, your people. 
And uh, Father, I thank you that they have an open heart, a heart to receive, a heart that is receptive to your word, to your spirit in this hour, in the name of Jesus, and that you have your way in this place, God. Save, heal, deliver, set free, God. Open up the eyes of our understanding so we can walk with you in purity and righteousness, oh God. Amen. You received? Okay, so Genesis chapter 3, let me show you something. Genesis chapter 3, and I want to give you an opportunity to sow, but I want you to see what you do. This is Genesis chapter 3. Um, verse, let's just look at verse 13 real quick. Verse 13, and it says, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. We'll leave that alone. Verse 14, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust. All the days of your life. Verse 15. I want you to take note of verse 15. He, God said, and I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So what's interesting, if you ever went to biology, you realize that a woman does not have seed. Amen? Ain't nobody went to biology in here? Good God help us. But if you ever went to biology, you realize that a woman does not carry seed. But God says her seed <laughs> will bruise your head, Satan. What comes out of the woman will hit you right in the head. Amen? And he says between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So there's two different seeds. And the seeds are fighting for ground and the seeds are fighting for harvest. This is an offering message just to help you. This is, the seeds of poverty are fighting for harvest in your life. But there's another seed and that seed is with a capital S which is a divine seed. Somebody say a divine seed. divine seed. So the little s is not a divine seed. That little s comes from this world. It's still a seed. But that seed is the seed of Satan, which is a poverty seed. But there is another seed that comes from heaven that is a prosperity seed. Amen? And God says her seed with the capital S will bruise your head. Now, let me ask you, would you just love to smack the devil? Or do we not think he exists? I mean, God talk about him. Jesus talk about him. The church don't really talk about him. But wouldn't you really like to catch him and smack him? God just showed you how. God said her seat. Now, my question to you, I know this is an interactive service. Not like the movies where you sit there and just eat your popcorn. <laughs> it's interactive, amen. It's good for us to be interactive. And so it's interesting that God says between her seed and your seed, but the woman does not have a seed. So where did the woman get a seed from? I said, where did the woman get a seed from? Let me ask you this. Where did the woman get a seed from and that seed had the power to smack the enemy on the head? <sighs> we might, might need to heat it up a little bit here. I think, I think everybody a little, little cold and shivering in their chairs. I know those of you listening online. So where did she get her seed from that had the power to beat the enemy up? Are you ready? Are you sure? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to I want to I want to put some power in you. Power that is usable. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You ready? Verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower Now he, capital letter he, 
is God who supplies seed to the sower. So God gave the woman a seed to sow. His name is Jesus. But God gives you opportunity to have the same power to receive seed to sow because God just doesn't do one thing one time and it's null and void. It is a spiritual principle that God gives you seed to sow so that that seed which came from God will bust the devil's head. <laughs> okay. I think I'm preaching harder than you're receiving. But you're receiving, amen? And so verse 10 says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower, somebody said, that's me, and bread for food. Watch what happens. Supply and multiply the seed that you ate. Oh, I wish you would read with me. He says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you eat, the seed that you hide, the seed that you keep, or does he multiply the seed that you sow? Why? Because the seed that you sow has the power to stop poverty. Poverty is an enemy. Oh, yes, it is. I said poverty is an enemy. Do you know poverty is an enemy against your children? No, poverty is an enemy against your children. Poverty is an enemy against nutrition. You ever try to eat a good meal? Costs money. So poverty is an enemy to nutrition. Poverty is an enemy to a good life. Poverty is an enemy. But God gave seed to the woman that would hit the enemy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you blessed? Amen. Would you receive more? Yes. Would you receive more? Yes. See, to do more, you got to receive more. To receive more, you got to sow more. <laughs> to do more, you have to receive more. So once you become a doer with what you have, then you open the door for more to do more. Amen. And you know, I can look at all of you and say that your hearts are to do more. But if you have a heart to do more and no ability to do more, what good is a heart that wants to do more but not an ability to do more? Now your heart is grieved because you don't have the power to produce what's in your heart. Oh, my God. God. Amen. Amen. Are you here? So what good does God give you a heart for that wants to do more but not the knowledge of the word to do it? So now you have a heart that goes, I want to, but no power to accomplish the I want to. But the power comes by the word to show you what your heart wants. This is the way to get it done. Oh, y'all sleeping on me today. Are you here? So I always want you to remember, when you go and read Genesis and see what God did through the woman, always put yourself in her shoes and say, if God gave the woman seed, she had no power to produce seed. In fact, it was, can, I, can I talk to you a minute or you want your children to go? Because I want your children to preach to you when you're driving down the road. No, because see, it wasn't in the woman's DNA to have seed. It's not in her DNA to carry seed. You say, well, I was always broke. I've always been in poverty. It's not in my DNA to be wealthy. But in the Genesis, it wasn't in the woman's DNA to have seed. But God tells your arch enemy, Satan, her seed will bruise your head. You know what Satan could have said? The woman doesn't have a seed. He could have called God a liar. But Satan knows one thing. Whatever God says, that's the way it is. So I say the same to you. Whatever God says, 
That's the way it is. Come on, I'll give you a chance to sow your seed. Amen. Let me hear you say bless. Let me hear you say bless, 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 say bless, bless. But thou is marked up brightly, like a night in a dark land. But thou is placed in my heart, all the Lord's commands. He set me up for nations, that I hear the beast away. He's rising up with me. name. God, we just thank you right now for the opportunity to give and show and do with what you give us, God, on purpose, Father. We thank you that we have an understanding in us, God, that even if something is not in us, God, because we have turned our life over to you and you are in us today, that empowers us to accomplish what we could never do on our own. And for that, we give you thanks and we sow our seed with love and adoration unto you, O oh God. And we ask you to have your way in our life. Minister life to us today, O oh God. Hallelujah. Let the seed that we have sown today, hallelujah, have the power to smack the enemy in our life, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name. And for that, we give you thanks, glory, and honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> 
Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You're blessed. Blessed. Amen. You are blessed. Y'all can be seated. Can you give a hand to the worship team? So awesome. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Grateful that you're here today and those, those watching online all over the place on your vacation and your family time. That's awesome. We are uh, grateful. I've got some things I want to share with you. Um, and I think I want to start out in Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, good to see you, brother, sister. God bless you. Hallelujah. Y'all ready for the new year? Ready for what God has for you? Awesome. We're going to have an awesome New Year's night service tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. We're going to worship first and foremost. We're just going to start out in worship. And then we're going we're gonna to jump into prayer. <clears throat> and we're just going to pray and pray and pray and pray. Anybody pray and pray? Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. And pray and pray and pray and pray. That, that shouldn't stop you from coming, right? Because we're going to pray. No, you should be like, yeah, we're going to get here because we need to pray our New Year's in. Not party our New Year's in, right? We need to pray it in. In the world, you used to party your New Year's in, you know what I mean? But not that you, you're no longer in the world, right? Now that you're no longer in the world, you're in the kingdom. Now, because you are a mature believer in the kingdom, you pray your New Year's in, amen? You worship your New Year's in because you know the way you start is the same way you'll finish. Huh. If you start in power, you will finish in power. Amen? Amen? See, how you start and how you finish are very important. Uh, how you start and how you finish are important. Everything else in the middle, it don't matter. The Bible calls Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. Somebody say Jesus is the author and finisher. <clears throat> what about the middle part? He's the author and the finisher. Amen. So how you start and how you finish is important. So I like to start my new year and finish my new year on the same note. In his presence. With his word. Amen. I want you to go to Luke chapter 17. I got a lot of notes I'm going to try to run through. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about is faith or assumptions. Faith or assumptions. Okay. When, when you look up the word assumption, it, it seems like faith. Have you ever looked up the word assumption? Well, we're going to look it up right now. You ready? Assumption. A thing that is accepted as truth or as certain to happen without proof. Listen to this. This is assumption. A thing that is accepted as true or as certain to happen without proof. God, somebody said, man, that sounds just like faith. Doesn't that sound like faith? Faith, you just accept it and believe it and receive it and you have it. But faith and assumption are not the same thing. And it's kind of disappointing to see Christians live in assumption but not in faith. See, the word assumption is a noun. But the word faith is a verb. I didn't do too good in school, but I come to find out that a noun and a verb are not the same thing. I found out that a noun just sits there. But a verb moves. Are we in class today? <laughs> so when I found out that assumption was a noun, it made perfect sense to me. That means a lot of Christians assume this is the way it's going to be because that's what they believe. But that just sits there and it never accomplishes anything. In fact, I say assumptions is the mother of all mistakes because we assume something to be something and then it proves out to not be that. But faith has proof. <laughs> no, faith has proof. We say, well, faith is blind. No, faith ain't blind. Faith ain't deaf. Faith ain't dumb. Faith speaks. It hears. It sees. Amen. Amen. Assumption is blind. Assumption is that you take something without evidence believing that it's true. 
Are you with me? And there's many Christians who live in assumption with their life. And, and, and they go from one assumption to another assumption to another assumption, and they claim it's faith. Say, that's not me. Oh, come on, be in faith. Say, it ain't me. I just don't assume my life to be something when there's no proof that it is. You know how I know many, many people. Are you, are you, are you with me? Wave at me if you're here. You online wave. Can, can you uh, kill some of that for me, please? But assumption. You know how, how uh, uh, I don't know if you're ready for this one. Are you here? Are you ready for this? I'm just going to be free. Can I be free? <laughs> Do you realize that many Christians assume they're Christians, but there's no proof? Let me say it about five more times. <laughs> See, assumptions is the mother of all mistakes. You can assume you're a Christian because you said a prayer, but there's no proof of the prayer that you said. That's assumption, and assumption has a real problem when truth walks in. Let's talk about Adam and Eve. They assumed that they were all right when they sinned because they found some fig leaves or some kind of covering to cover themselves, and they figured out that they were all right because they put something on when they discovered that they were naked, but in their nakedness, they covered themselves with assumption until the Father showed up. An assumption before God became empty. Amen. This is, this is why I say you better come with expectation, knowing that God's getting ready to rock your life into a whole other realm. See, you can't live your life as a Christian in assumption. Well, you know, uh, everything going to be all right. How do you know? Well, because I'm a Christian. Well, let's go thou, down through generations of Christians who assumed everything was going to be all right. We want to talk about that group. We want to talk about the few that came out on top. But we want to talk about the thousands that came out on the bottom. I'm not saying that they didn't make it to heaven. I'm talking about you live a life of assumption will always lead you to a dead end road. Because assumption has no power to bring forth life. Only faith does. Faith has the power to bring forth life. Assumption assumes that life is going to show up. Wave at me. See, what I want, I, I want you to hear today is I want you to check the files of your life and find assumptions so you can throw that file out. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's that one that causes the computer to shut down all the time and you sit there and cry and be like, man, why is this computer so slow? It's got a virus called assumption. And until somebody plucks that thing out, it ain't going to be what it's supposed to be. No, I know. We just bought a computer, put it in there, and everybody's using it. It's fast and it's going. And then a month later, it's choking. So if an IT guy can help me, I really appreciate you. I'm helping you now. You can help me later. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I found out that my children be just, you know, scrolling and Googling and this and that and look at this game and look at this, look at that, look at this, and it, it all gets clogged up. And we can come to a place that assumptions clog our life. Faith never clogs your life. Faith always pushes. It breaks things open. Assumption just keeps it clogged. It's like we have so many assumptions on our life of faith wall. Listen, I'm not knocking faith wall because we're we, we probably going to teach a little bit on that tomorrow night. That you better have something you're looking forward to that God said is going to come to pass. So you better have that, amen. But there are many people who have faith. Assumption walls, even though they got the letter faith, you know, like we have faith for life up there. We talk about faith. We live faith. Amen. It's not assumptions for life. And many Christians, because they, they go to church and they, you know, they gave their heart to Jesus, they live a life of assumptions and they live from one assumption to another assumption, but never come 
The Bible says never coming to the full knowledge, the fullness of expectation. Have you ever had a woman say, I assume I'm pregnant? <laughs> You'd be like, what's wrong with you? Well, I assume I'm pregnant. Nine months later, they still assume. <laughs> I assume I'm pregnant. Why do you assume you're pregnant? Well, because I throw up every morning. And you never look at the food you eat for breakfast. You just assume you're pregnant because it's like morning sickness. You eat the bad Cheerios and you, you know what I'm saying? And you're like, I must be pregnant. That is an assumption. See, faith has proof. Faith has proof. Faith has evidence. Faith has evidence. In fact, can I just talk to you? Let, 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 me, let me give you this. Faith is fully persuaded. When you're in faith, you are fully persuaded. Nobody can talk you out of it. I said nobody can talk you out of it. When you are in faith, that word faith in you really means I am fully persuaded. Nobody can tell me otherwise because what I believe, I have evidence in what I believe. Nobody can tell me any different. See, an assumption, somebody can talk you out of it. When you're assuming, then somebody can come with evidence and trump your assumption. Come on, Christian folk. We want to know the truth? We're called to live on a level of faith that God gave us. Not a world's assumption, but a heavenly faith. And many Christians will trade a heavenly faith for a world of assumptions. Amen. Have you ever been there? Come on, I, I can't teach it if I ain't been there. I assume many things until God front me. God talked to me. He said, why do you assume that? Why do you think that? What do you think? And I have nothing to tell him. See, when you're, you're assuming, you have nothing to back up your assumption other than what you think it's supposed to be or what you think it's going to be. That's assumption. Well, faith always has something to back it up. So if you're fully persuaded, let's talk about Mary since we hit Mary. You know, we, we went there. Can you imagine if her husband told her, look, I don't want to marry you because, you know, you, you're crazy. You can say, why are you crazy? Because you think you're going to have a baby without me. You know what she said to him? I know that I'm going to have a baby without you. And then nothing you can say changed what I know. How do you know? Because I had an encounter with God. And when I encountered God, he put faith in me for what he was saying. So nobody can take it from me. Like me or not, I got it. Somebody say, I got it. No, when God gives it to you, you got it. And nobody can persuade you otherwise. When you know what God has said to you, nobody can take you off of it. This is true Christianity. True Christianity is faith in God. It's not a life of assumptions. It's like somebody just going and sitting in the garage on a chair saying honk, 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 and a flashlight. And thinking you're a car. That's assumption. You park yourself in a garage, call yourself a car. You can sit there for the rest of your life. You'll never turn into a car. That's what assumptions are. You, you assume something, but it will never be because it ha assumptions has no power in it. Faith has power. The Bible says that God spoke the world into existence. There was nothing there. He didn't assume that it was going to come to pass. Are you with me? If I'm a little loud, it's because, you know, it's burning in me. Don't get mad at me. You let it burn in you, 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 you just can't hold it either. When the word of God burns in you, you can't hold it. And, and you see, so God didn't assume the world was going to come to pass. He didn't think like, well, you know, it's going to happen one day. No, God looked at the vast expanse of emptiness and he said, light be. That's faith. Amen. What did he have to go on? Nothing but himself. 
Hear me now. What did God have to go out on? You know, we talk about go out on a limb and go out in faith and go out in this. No. What do you have to go out on? What God had was himself. You believe that? God didn't look around and say, who do I believe in? God said, no, this is what I want and this is what's going to happen. Light be. And then he made us. And when we become Christians, we are not supposed to go out on a limb of assumption. We're not supposed to live our life on limbs of assumptions. Amen? If we have faith in God, where does that faith come from? It doesn't come from assumptions. Are you here? Faith has a author. It has a beginning. Doesn't faith have a beginning? Faith comes by hearing God speak. When his word is speaking, you're hearing God. And in that is the author or the beginning of faith. So faith has an origination. Oh, boy. You can take notes. You should. I said faith has an origination. Faith originates from somewhere. It doesn't just, here it is. Assumptions are just, here they are. I assume this is the way it's going to be. But nothing to back up the assumption. That's why the assumption is a noun, because it doesn't produce anything. It makes you believe that this is what's going to happen, but doesn't mean it's going to happen. Faith has an originator. It comes from the Father. So when you have faith, that faith is not yours except that it was brought to you. Oh, God. It comes to you by hearing. Faith comes to you by hearing. But there's an originator of where that faith came from, and it is the Father. And it is the Father that gives you faith. Amen. But you can't get faith unless you hear him. Amen. Oh, you didn't hear me. When you read the word, you're hearing him. When you're meditating on the word, you're hearing him. When you're in worship and you recognize his voice, you're hearing him. That's where faith comes from. See, too many people in Christianity, mainly, it's amazing how Christianity has become such a religion. And it's just all built on assumptions. That's not the design of it. Can you imagine the father design a relationship and the people turn it into a tradition? Can you imagine the father having a child saying, hey, let's get together. Let's spend some time. Let me tell you why I made you. And then you go, oh, okay. And you go build your own thing. That's what Christianity has become. We build our own thing. How, how can you build something without the originator? And it being original. <laughs> okay. I don't want to go too heavy. Are you with me though? I want you to get this. You get this, you'll, you'll understand. When God is doing something in your life, you'll have faith for it. You won't rely on assumption and hope souls and maybes. You will have a fully persuaded heart to know that no matter what, this is what he said. That's true faith. Faith doesn't waver. Faith does not waver. I said, faith does not waver. How can faith waver when the originator of faith is God? God doesn't waver. What he says, he says, and that settles it. So how can faith waver? Faith doesn't shake and waver. Because God doesn't shake and think, well, maybe I made a mistake here. Let me, let me, let me, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe. Let me ask somebody. <laughs> God, look around, there ain't nobody to ask but me. Are you with me? Amen. So true Christianity, somebody say true Christianity. Come on, we can say that without being oh, weird. There's always a true and there's always a false. Get that, get that so strong in you. 
You know how many counterfeit dollars are out in the world? I guarantee you some pass through your hands you don't even know. You ever got a counterfeit bill went up there? You, 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 you don't know? You're like, ooh, that looks good. Take it to the bank. They mark it. Where'd you get this from? You didn't know somebody slipped you a fake right in the midst of the real. Well, just like every real, there's a fake. So there has to be a true Christianity. Paul talked about it. Jesus talked about it. Amen. Gee, you know the father, he talked about it, her seed, his seed. A real and a fake. So there's always a true, there's always a false. And so we must understand this in our time to know the age of information, the age of all this speaking to us, speaking to us, speaking to us, everybody saying this, that, and the other, and this preacher, and that preacher, and this one, and that one, and this, and this, and this interpretation. That's your opinion, and that's this, and that's that. Which one is slipping in the real? Which one is slipping in the fake? And then you go to the bank to cash it, and you find out all you got is assumption. Now, see, when you go to the bank, the bank says, hey, that 20 bucks is fake. So you end up 20 bucks short because they don't give you a real one for your fake one. Have you ever thought about that? I guess somebody had never slipped a fake one to you. Travel around a little while. You, you. But when you go to the bank, who's the, the authenticator of that money, the bank will say, hey, that one's fake. And take it from you. Which means that thing has no value. So assumptions have no value. Because when you take assumption to the bank of heaven, it doesn't cash. It doesn't cash. The father's like, I can't do anything with assumption. God is pleased by faith. And faith has an originator. The originator of the faith is him. So when you have real faith, true faith, you can go to the Father and it would always be cashed. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can always trade in your faith for a need. You can always trade your, your faith in when you go before the Father. Because when it's true faith, real faith, he always, somebody say he always cashes it. <laughs> Because if faith is the currency of heaven, then what is assumptions? Say it again. Say it again. Go ahead, say the counterfeit. So assumptions in Christianity are counterfeit faith. And that's what brings us down. Come on, you have a thousand bucks and you're like, whoa, I'm going to go spend it. You go to the bank and half of that is fake. You lost $500. You won't be like, woohoo! Great, isn't that awesome? I'm 500 bucks short. So when you go to cash assumption and you try to get the father to move on assumption and he just sits there. But God don't understand, I love you. And the bank is saying, I, I, I know. But it's not about love, it's about understanding the difference between the two. It, it's not about love. You can't get God to move based on your love. The Bible says it is, it's, he's not moved by love. He's moved by faith. I do know, and I can read you the scripture, that faith only works by love. No doubt. But it's not your love that moves God. So your love doesn't move God. There are people that love God, die sick. They tried to cash their faith in. It, it didn't work. I've seen it. Amen. Are you getting something? Well, we're going to finish this here strong. You're not going to be an assumption walking into 2018 assuming that this is the way it's going to be. And then you try to cash that and it just. God's like, I, I, I can't do nothing with that. Amen. Has anybody realized that God is a spiritual principle God? you haven't heard that, he's, he, he's spiritual principles. If you learn the keys to the kingdom, spiritual principles, they'll always work. You'll never get locked out of your house because you know how to use the key, right? But you can stand there and assume the door's going to open and it'll never open. 
And you say, well, this is my house. I swear this is my house. I parked in the driveway. I know these trees. The door should open. And the door will never open. But when you learn how to use your faith, it will always open for you. Amen. But you have to determine what is faith and what is assumptions. And once you start realizing what true faith is and walking in true faith, you, you can recognize assumptions. And when you recognize assumptions, you can help people that are in assumptions. Not by, you know, just, just by because, man, I love you. So, uh, so uh, you know, people, people are like, Pastor, this and this and this. Well, where's that at? <laughs> Where'd you find that? Is it in the Bible? Well, no, but I love God. But if it ain't in the Bible, God's not accountable for it. So you can't cash that. I don't care how much you love God and assume because you love God and you go to church five days a week that God's going to cash your fake faith. Am I helping somebody? So we cannot live in this lollipop land of assumption thinking that God's going to do something that God is not accountable to do because it's all based on assuming real faith gets God to move real faith gets God to show up huh? you know one of the ways you know you're in real faith is because you heard him already can I say that one more time you know, I know a lot of Christians in, the, in our time period, for whatever reason, don't believe they really need to hear God. That's their first mistake because faith comes by hearing. That's one of the things I learned. Oh, my God, I better learn my father's voice because when I didn't know his voice, I just lived life like a loose cannon, everything, oh, I hope this works out. And I would try everything and nothing would work out. I finally figured out that, man, I'm sure missing something. And when I realized that I was missing something, I went back to the originator and learned to be still and know his voice so that I wouldn't do something that he wasn't telling me to do. Have you ever been there? You've done something thinking, well, maybe that's it, and you jump out and do it, and God's like, I never said nothing. See, if God never says nothing, then you were never in faith. Can I help you today? This is where people make their mistakes. Well, I'm believing God. Did God say? Well, I'm really, be I'm just believing God for this. Did God say anything about that to you? Well, I don't have to hear God. I found it in the word. Well, that's good. Now that you found it in the word, does that talk back to you? Because I can find a whole lot of things in the word. Like Judas hung himself. You can find a whole lot of things in there that'll that'll help you. Judas hung himself. How does that help you? Did did God tell you? No. He did it. <laughs> Doesn't say you do it. I know that's an extremity, but it's a point. The extremity of that point is that there are many other things in the scripture we jump on and God never said ride that horse. Amen? So that's the difference between faith and assumption. Just because you hear it, you know, all that, that, this, that, and the other, that preacher, this thing, or, you know, my mom said or my dad said, and, ooh, that's a great idea. Did you hear God say it? Did you hear God say it? You say, well, God doesn't speak to me like that. That's the problem. He does. Somebody say he does. He does. Somebody say he does. I'm telling you, he does speak to you like that. I remember the first time, you know, me and my wife, we're young. Oh, we're so young. Yeah, I know we are. We're so young still. But I, I remember, you know, we were living with mom because we had a beautiful, wonderful child. And we needed a place to go, so we lived with mom. We got tired of living with mom, and we needed to find a place. We found a place. We rented the place. 
And then they sold the place while we were renting the place. Got like 30 days to leave. I said, whoa, man. So we found a place, kind of. And when I sat down to sign the papers, the salesman was telling me, hey, do this for your wife. As a good salesman. For himself. He said, do it for your wife. Just sign the papers, man. I said, man, I don't know, man. I don't understand all this. I'm still a little, huh, give me some more time, man. Let me read, let me, let me think about this. He said, man, do it for your wife. My wife's sitting right there. Yeah, do it for me. <laughs> we need a place to live. We need a place to live. Do it for me. We need a place to live. Sign the papers. I got pressure from the salesman, pressure from my wife, and nothing against her, man. We, we, we good. 25 years good, girl. And on and on and on and on. But we're, I'm sitting there and the guy's telling me, do it for your wife. Sign this. You know, I was getting ready to buy this 16 by 80 trailer wide house. So I'm, you know, all that, you know, sell it. Man, put this money down. Man, I said, man, I don't want to do this. I don't know why. I wasn't walking with God. I didn't recognize that God was hollering at me because I didn't have a real relationship with him. I, I, I learned later that I was living most of my life on assumptions. And the guy's like, look, man, don't worry about your mom and dad. I'm like, what does it have to do with my mom and dad? What's all this, man? And inside of me is saying, no. And I'm sitting there and nobody ever taught me to listen to the kingdom on the inside of me. No preacher ever told me. They always wanted to tell me nice, happy-go-lucky stories just so I can come back another weekend. Nobody wanted to tell me if you don't listen to the kingdom of God on the inside of you, you're going to mess your life up. And when the kingdom of God was screaming inside of me, no, don't do it. I was like, shh, be quiet. I don't know who you are. Sign the paper. Worst decision I ever made in my life. Once we bought that house and moved in, we fought and argued. That's the place we, we, we got our divorce. That's the place she died in a car wreck. Everything took place when I bought that house. The kingdom was screaming, no, I have another plan. But I couldn't hear the kingdom because nobody taught me the voice of the kingdom. And that's what faith is. Faith speaks to you. When everybody else says yes, faith will say no, don't be moved. Or when everybody says, no, don't do it, faith inside of you is saying, yes, this is the Lord. And so as a believer, you cannot live your life based on assumptions. Assuming everything's going to be all right. Assuming this is the way it's going to be. Assuming this is going to happen and that is going to happen. But there's no foundation of faith in there. Amen? I call that mental assertion. You mentally assert that this is the way it's going to be. It's like your soul figures it out. But your spirit is saying, no, that's not God. Because your spirit is in unity with God. But as long as we stay a soulless Christian, we cannot hear the voice of the Lord because our soul screams louder than the spirit. Are you here? And so we cannot base our Christianity on we go to church, you know, uh, I'm a nice guy. Uh, you know, I gave my heart to Jesus a long time ago. You cannot base your Christian walk on that. You must base your walk on proof. Can I help you? Does a dog have to prove what a dog is? Or when a dog walks up, its proof is in its walk. You know a dog when a dog walks up because it doesn't come standing on two legs talking to you. It comes walking on four with a tail that's wagging and a tongue that wants to lick you. You're like, that's a dog right there. It doesn't even have to say a word. But based on its walk, you already know what it is. And 
and we've turned Christianity in nothing but a talk. God made it a walk. He said, come, follow me, which is a walk. That's not assumptions. Assumptions are talk, but faith is a walk. Hmm? You know, with faith, less is said and more is done. <laughs> Let me say that over here. They got a little nervous over there. Y'all be all right. With faith, less is said, but more is done. Because when faith is released in you, you believe it, you start doing it. Are you with me? When God says this is coming, then you say, yes, sir, I receive that. And you start moving on what he said is coming. Even though you can't see it, you know that it's on its way because you heard the Father say, it's coming. So you start going, yeah, this is coming. That's why when I talk to some of you, I tell you, man, get ready and start doing this because this is coming. Why? Because when I walk right by you, I heard the Father say, tell him this is coming. Maybe because you heard it, you, you didn't know what it was. So I was just repeating what you probably heard but didn't know what you heard. Ever been there? That's, that's all right. That's right. Amen. Are you here? So faith follows instructions. Don't tell me you have faith and you're not following instructions. I, I, I'm going to make it real clear today. When, when faith comes by hearing, the originator of faith is the Father. When the Father releases his word, you have faith in you because you receive the word, whether through the scriptures or through personal relationship with him. Faith is there. Now, when faith is there, faith has instructions to follow. Faith is not blind. Faith is, can somebody help me say that, please? Faith is not blind. Faith is not deaf. And faith is not dumb. Faith is practical. Very practical. When the Father speaks to you and you have faith in that that he said, when he says it, then you start doing the instructions of what he said. See, the proof that you believe it is the following the instructions. When you don't believe what he says, the proof of doubt is no following instructions. Can I say that again? I really want you to get this tonight. I want you to get it so deep in you that you'll recognize and begin to move in different forms. See, when faith speaks, it, it gives instructions. It doesn't just, you look, let's think about this. Noah, it's going to rain. Build a boat. Amen, Father. But I said, first of all, what's a boat? Can you imagine Noah being blind in faith, building something he ain't never built before and has no blueprints? That's not how it works. When the father told him this is what's going to happen, we don't get all of that story, but we get it in his actions. You find it later when God showed Moses the tabernacle of heaven and told him to build it. He gave him the word with instructions. The word was the faith to build it, but the instructions was the know-how to get it done. Are you here? So don't tell me I got faith and you're not following a, a plan of instructions. Because when God tells you something, hey, this is what I have for your life, you, you're supposed to first say, that's the Lord, I received that. Somebody say, I received that. See, listen, God told you long time ago that you will become ministers of the gospel. But if you don't sit down long enough to get instructions about how that's going to happen, then you cannot be moving in faith. Do you understand me? 
So if God is saying this is who you are, you've got to sit there long enough to get the instructions to take the first step. Are you here? And if you don't get the first step, you've got to go back to him. And back to him. And back to him. Many people just jump out and do it. And that's why they become so burdened and stressed out. Because they're doing something that God said but never got instructions on how to get it done. Amen? Amen? And I know people get things done out there. They get things done. But doesn't mean God's stamp is on what they got done. You better watch that. You better watch that. Are you receiving? Faith comes with instructions. Faith comes with instructions. I said faith comes with instructions. If it didn't come with instructions, it wouldn't be faith. I'm fixing you. Some people say it's just faith. I get out there and get it done. Huh? No, you need to just get out there and get it done. Jesus said, follow me. In other words, follow the pattern. Follow the instructions that are in front of you. What do you think Jesus did the time he was here with his disciples? When he laid hands on the sick, when he cast out devils, when he raised the dead. What was he doing? Come here. What was he doing? They were with him. What were they getting? Not just faith when he spoke, they were getting the instructions on how to get it done while they were right there with him. He said, come follow me. So everywhere he went, the disciples were right there. He was showing them by a living example on how to raise the dead, how to heal the sick, how to cause the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. It, it, it wasn't blind faith, now go and do it. This is what many Christians try to do. Woo, let's go and do it. But hold on. Has God spoke to you? No, he told me to go do it. Good. Then get prepared to go do it. But while you're preparing to go do it, you better be listening for instructions. Because if you're not listening for instructions, Because if you're not listening for instructions, you're really not in faith. Whoosh, <laughs> that's the Holy Ghost girl. <laughs> Are you here? God does not want us to live a a, a sorrowful, empty life. Hope souls. I hope so. I hope so. Can you imagine the disciples who, when Jesus went and they went through their season, then they're empowered with the Holy Ghost and they're going around saying, I hope so? Can you imagine? Peter, James, John, you know, all these fellas, Paul, Silas, you know, I hope so. I hope God touches you when I pray for you. You know, they were so strong, they said, you better sit down because you're about to get laid out. No, they were very strong. They were very strong because they knew by instructions what was about to happen. <laughs> you think Peter just thought about, hey, you know what, just throw all the people on the side of the road and when I walk by... I'll heal him with my shadow. Do you think Peter just said, oh, that's a great idea because I don't have time to lay hands on everybody. I got to get to the next city. No, he got instructions on how to deal with everything that was going on. So faith was speaking to him. Faith was showing him what to do. Faith without instructions is really dead. It's just like faith without action. See, because faith is an action word. So if you have faith without instructions, it's idle. It's just sitting there. It, then it turns into assumption. This is where a lot of Christians get to. They get, oh, I, I'm believing God, I have faith. And then they never see anything come to pass in their life. They do it with their own power. <laughs> they build it with their own 
abilities. Amen. There's a lot of things that people build. Come on, the Tower of Babel was built by people without God. Did you hear that? You didn't hear that? I said the Tower of Babel was built by people without computers, without technology, and without God, but yet they still built a tower that God had to step in and stop it. That was people without God. You think people can't build something without God today and call it God? If they did it in the scripture, they could do it today. That's why as believers, you better check yourself and recognize, am I really with God or am I only assuming that I'm with God? The hardest thing to discover is at the end of your days, you walk out of this life all living in assumptions and you find yourself in hell. And people don't believe that mess today. Oh, that's just mess. That's just mess. But it's all in your Bible. Those are the pages we flip through and skip over because I don't want to believe that. But yet it's plain and simple truth. You cannot live your life in assumption and be pleasing to God. Amen? So I, I, as a believer, as a man of God, it's my responsibility to preach the word to you, to help you see if you're living in assumption, then the word is to help you break that assumption. And live in faith because faith is an action word. Faith is a word that moves. Faith is a word that accomplishes, not in its own, your own ability, but in its ability. Amen. You know, I was thinking, yeah, get mad at me. I, I, I love you. Get mad. I like when you get mad because it causes you to think. It opens you up to get out of the box of tradition and religion. But can you imagine, let's think about America and all her goodness that she is. Now let's strip her of every doctor, every lawyer. Let's strip America of every doctor, every lawyer, every bank, and every credit card and tell me where we are. Let me say that again because some of you don't want to even think about it. Let's strip America from every doctor and every lawyer every bank and every credit card and let's find out where we really are. Okay. I told you it was going to be a little heavy. But those are the times that Jesus lived. <laughs> Their doctors didn't have what we have. Their lawyers were nothing like what we have. There was no real banks and no real credit cards. All they had was faith. And yet their faith in a few people turned the world upside down. That's true Bible faith. That's the faith that is alive for us to have. A faith that doesn't move until it hears what God has to say. A faith that says, I need instructions on what you said to me. That's real faith. Are you receiving real faith? He said, it's not for me. No, it is for everyone who calls themselves a believer. Because when you call yourself a believer, that means you have faith in a God who came to save you. Are you here? Amen. So, faith follows instructions. Are you here? Faith is fully persuaded. Faith is only going to do what it was sent to do. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, Romans. Faith comes by hearing. But how does faith go? How do you release your faith? The first thing you do to release your faith is by saying. So faith comes by hearing and goes by saying. If you don't say what faith has said, it's still there. It hasn't been released to do anything Look, did I tell you to go to Luke's, Luke's, Luke's gospel? Go to Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel. So we need to recognize the difference between assumption and faith. Somebody say there's a difference between assumption and true faith. So when you go to Luke chapter 17... 
verse 5. It says, and the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Verse 6 says, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And then he goes on. I'm going to read this in the Amplified real quick. Verse 7. It says, well, verse 6, and the Lord said, if you have confident abiding faith in God, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, which has very strong roots, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea. And if the request, I love the Amplified, and if the request was in agreement with the will of God, it would have obeyed you. The Amplified says, if it was in agreement with the will of God. So if it's not in agreement with the will of God, then it's really not faith. Uh, are you, you understand this? You know, do you have it in the Amplified? You have it? we got to get that, okay? So if it's not in agreement with God, then it's not faith. Because how can faith be in disagreement with God? Are you here? Are you getting this? So if faith originated from God and you try to use faith and that is opposing the will of God, then what you're using is not faith. Are you here? Do you understand that? You got, I can't go no further until you understand me. So when we try to use what we call faith, but yet it doesn't line up with the will of God, then it's really not faith. It's assumption. Because real faith always lines up with God. Because it comes by the word. And God's word is his will. Are you, are you hear me? Amen. Okay. All right. Don't come to me next week, pastor, counsel me because I really messed up. No, go back and listen to the message. Help me, pastor, because I really got myself in a mix. Well, that's not my fault. That's what you're here for. So I don't have to counsel you. We want to spend most of our time in counseling. We don't want to spend most of our time in church. This is where the counseling comes. This is where the counselor's at. This is where he's building you, correcting you, adjusting you, causing truth to come alive in you. So we don't have to sit down for five hours and talk about how you slept around on your wife because, you know, I don't know. She wanted to leave me. Who cares? You should have been in church. I love y'all. Y'all fired up. So, <laughs> he's saying if, if the request was in agreement with the will of God, it would have obeyed you. But because the request is not the will of God, it can't obey you. So, what you're going out and doing is an assumption. Because in assumption, it doesn't have to do what you say. But in faith, because faith is in agreement with God, it has to say. Verse 7 says, which of you has, who has a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? Will he not instead say to him, prepare something for me to eat and appropriate clothes for yourself for service and serve me while I eat and drink? Then afterwards you may eat and drink. He does not thank that servant just because he did what he was ordered to do. So he's saying, look, you know, if you have a servant and the servant comes in from the field, you don't tell the servant, let me feed you. He's a servant. You say to the servant, hey, go get the right clothes on to serve me. <laughs> get in that kitchen and do what you do. You're a servant. That's what you do. Amen? Listen, your boss doesn't apologize for telling you to sweep the floor. Why should your boss apologize? Well, I'm sorry. I need you to sweep the floor. Hey, wait a minute. I pay you. I pay you. I don't have to apologize for telling you to go do something that you're getting paid to do. Come on, faith people. And that's what God is referring to faith. Faith is a servant. You pay the price for faith. I'll let you sit on that word. You pay the price for faith. I said you pay the price for faith. When people don't pay the price for faith, they don't have faith. There is a payment for faith. 
It's called uh, service unto God. How? Through reading, worshiping, and waiting, meditating. The only faith that is freely given is the faith of salvation. But you want faith for healing, it's not given to you. You got to pay the price for it. You got to get into that word. You got to find every scripture that talks about, I am the Lord God that healeth thee. I deliver you from destruction. You got to pay the price for that faith. You either pay the price for that faith or you go pay the doctor for your at some way you're paying for something that's what church folk they pay their doctor they pay their lawyer no god oh last you kill amanda oh you know it's hard to preach up here sometimes <laughs> no you either pay your doctor you pay your lawyer okay lord i really don't want to say that lord You give them more than you give God. Before you, before you even pay the price for faith, which could activate all these things in you, you'll pay a doctor and a lawyer more than when you offer to God. Because faith has no value to you. Because you don't know the value of faith. Faith is the, one of the most valuable things you can acquire. Because the first thing faith does is bring you into the kingdom. But faith is so valuable, yet we don't know the value of it. But we'll run to a doctor just like that. And we'll pay that $1,000, you know, copay. Just do it. It's the easy way out. But yet faith, when you pay for faith, it works faster than a doctor. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than a doctor. You don't have to get a second and third job to pay the doctor and pay the lawyer. You don't have to wait for some health care to come piping down the road. You can just say, hey, God said, let's stand, let's pray. Let's call the, the man of God, the woman of God. Let's call somebody with faith like mine that can anoint me with oil. Lay hands on me and let faith raise me up. And then go see the doctor. And he tell you just like he's told many of us. Oh, it looked like something happened, but it ain't there no more. <laughs> There's some kind of evidence of something happened, but there ain't nothing there no more. Hmm? Amen. But you got to pay the price for faith. Listen to me. If you get anything out of this night, learn one thing. You have to pay the price for faith. Christianity is not cheap. It's not cheap. You've got to be willing to pay the price. If you do not pay the price now, you'll pay the price later. But if you pay the price now, oh, man, talk about a good life. You'll have a good life. Say, I'll have a good life. Boy, Jesus. Are you here? And so faith is a servant to you. And if you don't tell faith what to do, it doesn't know what to do. Think you got a servant sitting there and you have a need of something and you've built your faith to accomplish that need, but yet you don't send him off. How do you send him off? You tell him, this is what I need you to go do. And you're specific about what you need. I remember I told the Lord, Lord, I, I'm ready. I, I feel like in my spirit it's time I can get a... Another truck, you know, I feel it in my heart. I, I feel the tug. I feel the pull. You know, I don't just do things because I want to. If I wanted to, I could have done it years ago. But God said, no, no, it's not time. So I waited, I waited, I waited. And I told the Lord what I wanted. But I wasn't very specific. And I should know better. But I was just in the moment. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, this is what I want. And I didn't pick my color, but I picked my style. <laughs> so I don't like white vehicles. <laughs> But yet I got exactly what I wanted, but it was in white. 
And I asked the Lord, Lord, why was it white? He said, because you never told me what color you really wanted. You picked every other amenity in it. But you never told me a specific color. So every time I drive it, I think, Lord, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I love you, Father. <laughs> he said, you didn't tell me. I only do what you tell me to do. So faith is only going to do what it was sent to do. Be specific. Now, to increase our faith, we must increase our love walk. When the disciples asked him, increase our faith, and then he said, your faith has to be just this, you can do this. Before that, in, in Luke 17, he was talking to them about being offended. Do not be offended. Do not take offense. Walk in love. Because the Bible says, faith only works by love. So you may have faith and believe, but it doesn't do anything because it has no love in it. So there's another aspect that you can judge in your life. Does, there, uh, does your love hold up your faith? If your love for God, your love for people, your love for each other, it, it has to hold up your faith. Otherwise, you have walls and no foundation. Faith works by love. It will not hold up except by love. Amen. And so how do you increase your faith or how do you accomplish greater things with your faith? The first thing you must do is build your love. How do you build love? By relationship. The Bible says that God is love. So how do you build love in you without a relationship with the Father? Because God is the originator of love. The Bible says he is love. So he originates love. And so if you, he originates love, he originates faith. So if you need those things, the only way to get them is to go back to the original. And you must have a relationship with him. And while you're relating with the Father, while you're spending time with the Father, what's taking place? Can I explain it like this? Can I, can I explain it like this? So, come here, I'm going to use you. You just happen to be available. So, what happens is, she's my daughter, by the way, so don't weird out. I'm her father, she's my daughter. So while the, the daughter comes closer to the father and relates with the father, they talk, they spend time together. Guess what happens? Do you want to know what happens? See, what's in the father automatically starts to come on the daughter. See, so when you're in the presence of the father, he is love. Do you know what's happening to you? Love is just getting all over you. That's why you have to be a real worshiper. Because to stay in his presence takes real worship. So a true worshiper really spends time in his presence. And while you're in his presence, there is a love in permeating your being that is building a foundation for faith. My God. Isn't that wonderful? So it's not rocket science. You don't have to be brilliant. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and then for those of you that are brilliant, take the brilliant hat off and just be practical. <laughs> Worship the Father. Let him embrace you. Nothing wrong with being brilliant, amen? Nothing wrong with not being brilliant. But none of that moves God. Amen. So let me, let me read. And are, we, are we good? Oh, look. I'm, I'm doing good today. So to increase our faith, we must increase our love walk. Amen. So God is love. Therefore, we must move closer to God in our life. Now, let me, let me help you with that. Because I know when we're born again, we're as close to God as we're ever going to get. Amen. Amen. If he's in you, you can't get any closer. But there are a lot of people that he's in, they don't even know who he is. Well, I went to the altar, and then, you know, I, I, I believe Jesus, and I accepted him, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Talk to him a little bit. Relate to him. Spend time with him. 
So he can be as close to you as possible right now. But you can be just like you, some of you could be right here and you could be right here right now. But yet you could be so far from service. But yet so close. Right? Some of you thinking about your dog at home right now. I wonder what my dog's doing. Well, you're not here. You're there. I wonder what my children are doing right now. You're over there with them. You're not here. So we can be like that with God. He could be in us, but we could be somewhere else. You understand that? He's right here, right? And we could be somewhere else. Or we could choose to be right here with him. And live with him, for him, right here, right now. And we have to relate to him. Amen? And it's not hard. Just talk to him. He said, but I don't understand him. So what? Can you imagine the first person you met you, you kind of fell in love with? You didn't even know him. Oh, I like that girl. You don't know nothing about her, but you follow her around all through school. <laughs> you remember that. And the other way, girl, you find that guy, you're like, oh. you don't even know him. You just, you just <laughs> fell in love when he walked by you. And this Armani cologne hits you. You're like, oh. I'm in love. What's his name? I don't know. <laughs> Where did he come from? I don't know. Don't know nothing about him, but you're in love. And then God comes and saves our life, and he's in us. I don't know him. Well, get a smell of him, man. Follow him around. Fall in love. Look for him. Uh, where did you come from, Father? <laughs> That's the way we should think. And you imagine if you go after him like that, he's going to stop running. <laughs> He'll let you catch him. Thank you, baby. She let me catch her. <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You receiving? <laughs> God will let you catch him. Tell your neighbor, God will let you catch him. But you got to chase him. So God is love. Therefore, we must move closer to God in our life. For our faith to be strong, we must have a stronger relationship with God. So for our faith to be strong, we have to have a stronger relationship with God. So God gives you faith to come into the kingdom, but he expects you to do something with it. Amen? Amen. And so to have greater faith or stronger faith, it's based on a stronger relationship. Listen, God's not going to tell somebody to do something that's going to break them. Amen? And if you think, well, how's it going to break me? Well, if your relationship with God is not strong enough and he tells you to do something, it'll break you. So God's not, there's, there's many things that God will not tell some people to do because they don't have the faith to do it. The reason they don't have the faith to do it is because they don't have the relationship. So some people say, God, I want to do this, I want to do that. God's like, I can't let you do it. The reason I can't let you do it is because that thing will break you until you have a real strong relationship. Amen. That's why you see people will jump out. They get excited about God. Woo, I'm excited. But they don't have a real relationship. They got touched by God. They get fired up, and then they go out, and five days later, they're crawling in. Like, what happened last week? You were like, woohoo, Jesus. I'm on fire. Glory. Crawling in five days later. Like, what happened? Where was that person that left, like, we had to, like, Slow you down so you didn't get a ticket running out of here. What happened? No relationship. No relationship. When you don't have a real relationship, see, I can give you something that God wants me to put on you to pow. You know, like those, those paddles that people have heart attacks and they shock them. Poof, blow, and they wake up. Well, sometimes that's what we do. The power of the Holy Ghost, bam, shock you. And you're like, whoa, I'm alive. And you can sing that song all week long. I'm alive. I'm alive. But you have no relationship. You go, I'm alive. 
I'm alive. I'm alive. Come back next Saturday. I don't know if I'm alive, Pastor. Because no relationship. When you have a real relationship, it strengthens your faith. Amen. Amen. Amen? If I didn't have a relationship with God, I couldn't do this. I couldn't. If I didn't have a real relationship with him, I'd be like, Lord, I'll take another profession. Pick one. I'll do it. <laughs> Why? Because, you know, it takes a real relationship with the Father to see how much he loves people. You and I know we couldn't love people as much as he does. You and I know, don't look at me like that, like, y'all, I'm the love hero. I, just, I can love anybody. No, you can't love anybody. Let them run you off the freeway and tell me how much you love them. <laughs> You're trying to chase them down. <laughs> what happened to your love? In church, I love everybody, Pastor. <laughs> no, you can't love everybody without God. Amen? And so a real relationship with God helps you love everybody. And that's how your faith will work. But it comes through real relationship. Somebody got ran off the road this week. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Amen. So faith, for faith to be strong, we must have a stronger relationship. So if you, you, you look at yourself and say, man, I really want my faith to work better and to be stronger. I want it to uh, accomplish more things. Well, let me give you the first clue. First clue, deeper relationship. Deeper relationship. Let me explain that. When you have a deeper relationship, that means conversations come easier. Huh? You know you have a relationship with people at work. Hey, how you doing? Great. How'd it go? Good. That's it. As far as it went, you walked away. There was no real talk. It was all what we call surface conversation, right? How was your day? You know, how was your drive to work this morning? Real surface. Would you, did you get your coffee? Nothing like how's your life. <laughs> See, but when you get in real relationship, you say, man, how's, how, how's it really going? It goes to another level, Right? Huh? Come on, I used to work in an office. I know how it was. Everybody's all. And then the one that couldn't hold it, <laughs> they couldn't fake it very well. They were stirring their coffee. Yeah. We still didn't have a deep enough relationship to talk about those things. Uh, so between you and God, if you don't have a real relationship with God, then your faith is, 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 is so minimal. That you depend on your flesh and other people's flesh more than you would depend on your faith. But a real deep relationship will cause you to go to God first. You'll run to God first. Somebody say run to God first. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to call every person. He wants you to call him. That's true relationship. Call God first. And then when God tells you to call that person, guess what you do? You call that person. You don't call that person first, and that person have to tell you, go to God. No, you should have went to God first, and then God would say, now you can call that person. Is this, is this working out all right for you? Are you getting some clarity? See, because there is a true faith, and then there is an assumption. Assumptions always go outside of God, but real faith goes right to God. You want me to say that again? Assumptions always go outside of God. Have you ever found yourself looking at other information than the Bible? Instead of going first to the Word, let me find help right here. We go, let me look in Google's. Come on, we've been there. It's, it's nothing we ain't done. We've done it. Let's go to Google's. <laughs> Yahoo. <laughs> Let's go find a, a book of an author that wrote about my problem. When we have the author of a book who wrote our answers. You see, that's what assumption does. We'll go outside of God, but faith will go right into God. Somebody say, I go right into God. Faith. Amen. 
All right, let me make sure I got everything. I, I ain't even gotten all my scriptures yet. But we're not going to go through all of them. Write them down if you want to. You ready? Luke 17, 5. Through, through 10. And then Galatians 5, 6 talks about faith works by love. That's the only way faith works. By love. Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. Faith pleases God. Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. Faith pleases God. Because God is love and faith only works by love. Can I, re can I read this to you? So, because God is love and faith only works by love. So when you're moving in faith, when you're moving in true faith, love is at work in you. <laughs> when you're really moving in faith, love is at work in you. God, when he sees your faith, he sees it backed by love. That's so powerful. Amen? Are you here? All right. Amen. So James chapter 2, verse 14. Let me read James 2.14. Let's see what James has to say. James, do you know James, the brother of Jesus Christ, became the pastor over the Jews in Jerusalem. And so he had, he had a great, great challenge um, in his work there. So James 2.14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Can faith save him? If he says he has faith but no works with that faith, can faith save him? He's asking a question. And obviously, he's giving you the answer. If you have faith but there's no action to your faith, your faith is dead. So dead faith cannot save you. Dead faith cannot help you. You understand? Dead faith cannot help you. Faith that doesn't have an action behind it doesn't do anything. It's unproductive. It's just as good as assumption. It doesn't profit anything. So faith has to have works. You say, well, how do you work faith? Faith comes with instructions. When you realize that faith has instructions, if God calls you to do something, if God says, hey, I need you right now in this time of your life, I need you to go and accomplish this. And you're like, yes, I'll do it, Father. Now you have faith for what he said to you. You got it. That's, that's it. But if you don't have any works with that, then you'll always be saying, yes, I got it, I got it. But you're doing nothing about what you got, so you'll never really get it. Amen? Are you receiving that? Say, I receive. And so when God tells you, hey, listen, this is what's coming, this is what's going to take place, or you see it in the Word, you're like, that's mine, then faith gives you instructions on how to have it. Some say, ah, God promised me to be a millionaire, but you don't even tithe. God ain't going to entrust you with a million when you don't even do the tithe on $10. You're in assumption. You'll always be broke according to God. Oh, you hear me? And you say, well, God promised me healing. And you, oh, God said I'll be healed. Uh, you know, I got this asthma. <coughs> you know, I don't know, but God said he's going to heal me. <sighs> Wait a minute. That is a lie to what you say you believe. Now, I'm not knocking people who go through situations. I'm just helping you understand. Doctor said you're going to die from a liver disease. But God is my healer and you still drinking that whiskey. Is it the truth? That's like going to the banker and the banker is saying, hey, buddy, listen, we're going to do this retirement for you and we're going to work it out. And every week you put $20 in. And by the end of the year, you're going to have $30,000 saved up. Woohoo! And every week you never put 20 bucks in. <laughs> and you go to the banker, dude, I don't know what's going on, boss. You told me by the end of the year I had 30000 He said, wait a minute. On one thing, did you put the 20 in?
And then we go to God. Well, God must be a liar. No, you deceive yourself. You didn't obey what God said, so you'll never have what God says you can have. Because faith is obedient. Oh, glory to God. Uh, y'all ready for the new year now? Faith is obedient. Faith and obedience. You can't have one without the other. When you obey God, you're in faith. When you're in faith, you automatically obey God. Stand to your feet. I, 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 I think I taught long enough. <laughs> you receive it? You get it? Does it change your life? You, you find any assumptions in your life? Assumptions are not based on the word of God. In other words, you haven't heard God speak to you about that thing. When you haven't heard God speak to you about it, then you're in assumptions. So it's quick to go, man, God, what is the truth on this thing? This is real easy. God speaks to you. He talks to you. He unctions you. He doesn't hide himself from you. Amen? Somebody say, I refuse to be in assumptions. I refuse to live my life in any assumptions. Father, I give you legal right. Come on, mean it. I'm, we're going to make a declaration. You better mean it. Say, Father, I give you legal right to wake me out of assumptions. I refuse to live a life of assumptions as a believer. As a believer, I live in faith. And faith has proof, has works, has life. Thank you for correcting me in any area of assuming. No more shall I assume. I'll go to your word. I'll go to my closet until I hear what you have to say. And once you have showed me, I'll be fully persuaded and nobody can talk me out of what your word says is mine. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you. Amen. Awesome. Lift your hands to the Lord. Just love on him. Worship him. Worship him. Hallelujah. Glory. Come on, just worship the Lord. Just let this be a sacrifice. Let me dedicate my life to worship you. Let this be a sacrifice. Let me dedicate my life to worship you. So I'm a lover of your presence. 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 Come on, just sing it out. Let this be a sacrifice. Let this be a sacrifice. Let me dedicate my life to worship. Go ahead and sing it, Caleb. Let me dedicate my life to worship you. Just sing it again one more time. Let this be a sacrifice. Let this be a sacrifice. Let me dedicate my life to worship you. All we need is your love. Can let this be a sacrifice. Let 
this be a sacrifice. Let me dedicate my life to worship you. Oh, I'm a lover of your presence. I'm a lover of your presence. I'm a lover of your presence. It's all I wanna be. your heart just sing it out tonight our passion stirring deep inside our passion stirring deep inside you're all that really satisfies we were we lift up your name oh our passion our passion stirring deep inside you're all that really Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, we worship you tonight. We thank you for your word. Thank you for clear revelation and understanding, Father, of truth and righteousness. God, your word of faith, which has come into our hearts and brings forth revelation, understanding. Hallelujah. We thank you for it today, O oh God. Well, Father, if there's anyone in this place tonight that is, does not know you, has walked away from you, maybe some situation has come up on their life, and Father, they are in a struggling moment of their life, oh God. I thank you, Father, that you've already made provisions for every circumstance that we face. The provision of Jesus Christ when we do not know you, when we are without you, you've made Jesus a provision for salvation. And we thank you, O oh God, for the Lord Jesus Christ that came and died for us. And Lord, in his death, God, he took the stripes upon his back and he said, by my stripes ye are healed. So Lord, those that have problems in their physical body, in their emotional soul, O oh God, we thank you that provision has already been paid for our freedom. And Father, maybe those that are going through a time that their faith has been weak or struggling or something has come upon their life that has shaken their faith, oh God. I thank you right now that there is already provision in the house for their freedom, oh God. And Lord, I ask you to touch every heart right now. Touch every person right now by the Holy Spirit and power, by the Holy Ghost and fire, Lord, that they would come to this place, Lord, if they do not know you, that your spirit would lead them to come right now to this altar. If they have walked away from you, oh God, that they have the unction of the spirit to come walk to this altar and turn their life back to you, oh God. Or maybe they're out there, oh God, and they need healing in their body and they need a boost of faith to receive their healing, oh God, that they would come to this altar tonight and that your spirit would meet them here at this place, Father. I thank you, oh God. Thank you for happening right now.
Thank you for it's happening right now. Thank you for it's happening right now. Come on, just lift your hands and close your eyes. And I want you to ask yourself, do I know Jesus? And if you don't know Jesus, then you need to come to this altar and let him meet you here. Maybe you walked away from Jesus. If you've walked from the Lord, I tell you, he loves you. He loves you very much. He loves you with everything that he is. Every person in this place, there is love for you. But you must meet that love. And I say that love came from heaven to earth to meet you. And it's not hard for you to come from your seat and to this altar to meet love. If love traveled from heaven to earth to meet you, it should not be difficult for you to leave your seat and come to the altar to meet love. And if you need healing in your body, take that step of faith and just come to this altar. The Lord will heal you. If your marriage is in struggles right now, I would tell you, come to the altar and meet love and let love restore your marriage. In the name of Jesus, I bless every one of you in this place tonight. I declare the freedom of the Lord, the freedom from religion, the freedom from the power of the enemy off of your life. That let this night be the night that God answers your prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm going to open the altars for you. You want to come and worship? If you want to come, you need prayer, I'll pray for you. God will meet you right here. Amen. The rest of you, we're going to worship the Lord. And then we'll see you tomorrow at 2. And then tomorrow night at 10. Amen. Come prepared. Come ready. Let God speak to you. Let God show you 2018 going to be the greatest year of your life. Amen. Amen. Just worship the Lord while you're here, while God ministers to these that are up here. Come on, worship the Lord.
God be God. Let him do what he wants to do. Let God be God. Let him do what he wants to do. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. To worship you, Come on, let God be God. Come on, just worship him. To worship you, I live.
on your behalf right now you know the Bible says that everything that concerns you God perfects it God perfects everything that concerns you 
things that are on our heart, things that are on my on my mind, whatever's whatever is, you know, that concerns you. The word says he perfects that thing. That means right now, in the midst of imperfection, in the middle of imperfection, because you have faith in God. Do you know when Paul was on that ship and he was on his way to see Caesar? And the Bible says that he told them we shouldn't go, but they went anyway. And the Bible says that the ship was torn up by a storm. And in the middle of the night, the Bible says an angel appeared to Paul. And he said to him, listen, Paul, don't worry about it. Because you're on this ship, there shall be no loss of life. So even though the thing looks like a disaster, but because you have faith in God, And because you're on this ship, nobody's going to die. They may lose some stuff, but they ain't going to die. There's nothing wrong with losing stuff. But I say to you, you will not die. In the middle of a storm, God sent an angel to minister to Paul. And when Paul came out that morning, he told the people, let, let me tell you something. When God speaks to you, there's a boldness that comes over your life. You're not afraid to talk to folk. And when Paul looked at everybody, he said, let me tell you something. I believe God. And what he has said unto me, that's the way it's going to be. So I'm saying to you that God is working on your behalf right now. God is working on your behalf right now because the Lord has come and said to me right now in this place, God is perfecting the things that concern your life. to him I just want to bless your name and I just want to bless your name just want to make you glad and I just, just want to make you glad just want to please you God and I just want to move your heart and 
give you all I am. All over this place, just lift up your hands. It's for your will and for your pleasure I exist for you. Somebody help me with that. Hernia. A hernia. What is that? You have a hernia? Oh, that's right there. Huh. Okay. How many believe God can heal this hernia? Amen. Amen. Come on, lift your hands. You believe God will heal this hernia? Believe God's a healer? Yes. Believe God's word says, huh? I am the God that healeth thee. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? And in the wonderful Isaiah 53 declares that, you know, that by his stripes we were healed, which means that over 2,000 years ago when Jesus took the stripes upon his back, every stripe was to heal every affliction in our life. All three? Wow. Okay. Anybody else? Well, let's agree. All three, huh? Amen. All three. God is the healer. Somebody say God's the healer. God's the healer. We're the believer. We're the believer. And, we believe and we believe that God's the healer. That God's the healer. And so we just receive. We just receive, we just receive, we just receive what he already did for us. Did for Amen. Us. Brother, come quick. Share. Brother, come. This brother that the Lord healed. You come. I want him to share real quick while they stand right here. I, I want you to tell him what the Lord did for you. Okay, este el 3 de diciembre, December the 3rd, eh, un predicador, a preacher, un siervo de Dios, a servant of God, oró por mí, he prayed for me. Y este porque yo tenía unos dolores I had pain que me recorrían todo el cuerpo that would travel up my whole body y se me dormía and it would feel like numbness cuando oró por mí me dijo when he prayed for me he told me que tenía el pie derecho más corto that I had my right foot was shorter than my left one que el izquierdo than my left one 
Y me dijo que por eso me venían los dolores. And he said because of that it's the reason for the pain. Y me dijo que tuviera fe. And he told me to have faith en Cristo y que Christ, él, él oraría por mí. That he was going to pray for me. Y el Señor es mi sanador. And God is my healer. Oró por mí. He prayed for me. Y el pie se me adelantó y se emparejó. And my right foot came to be longer and it, came, it paired up with my left one. Se me fueron los dolores. All the pain was gone. Inmediatamente. Immediately. Y, y yo estaba muy contento. So I was very excited, very happy. Porque sientes un alivio. Because you feel relief. Y, y le di muchas gracias a Dios. And I thank God so much. Um, pero a los cinco días. But five days later. Eh, me volvió un dolor ahora. Uh, today. Well, since then. Five days later after that there was a back pain. En la parte de atrás de la espalda. Behind my back, my lower back. Y esta parte. And, and this part right here. Y este... Hasta el día de hoy lo traía. Until today I had it still. Y, y ahorita ya no siento nada. And right now I'm free. I don't feel nothing. Gracias a Dios. So what I explained to the gentleman is that when the man of God prayed for him, he was healed. But five days later, the enemy tries to come back and bring a symptom of what you had. To see if you'll buy it again. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. See, because when God does something, he does it. The enemy tries to undo it. But you have to buy that. So you have to refuse to buy it. Because when God heals you, he heals you. Amen? So the Lord is healing you right now. While you're standing here. The power of the Lord is present to heal, the Bible says. And the power of the Lord is huh, evident upon your bodies. Lift your hands, sister. The presence of the Lord is evident. The power of God is evident. And he's coming upon your body. And the Bible says that God is the healer. He said, I am the God that healeth thee. And he doesn't take it back. He doesn't take it back. When he gives it to you, you got it. And you have to keep it. Somebody say, I'll keep it. I'll keep it. It's mine. He bought it. I'll keep it. I'll keep it. You want it? You can have it. It's yours. Jesus. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what it would keep you from doing. I, I, I don't know what it is. Does it keep you from moving or does it just hurt? How do you know when it's gone? Okay. Oh, the patch. I got you. I know that part. Okay. Yeah. So how do you know when they go? Good. The doctor said so. Good. See the doctor Tuesday. Because I cancel every word against your pregnancy. I cancel every word against your health. In the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, let's worship the Lord. I bless you. See you tomorrow at 2. We're going to worship and, and just go. It was tomorrow at 2 for Spanglish. And at 10 o'clock for our uh, New Year's night service. Amen. Love you. Worship you. Give the Lord praise. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you.
the song I sing more than the next heartbeat more than anything and Lord as time goes by I will be by your side cause I'll never want to go back to my old life I need you more More than yesterday, I need you, Lord. More than words can say, I need you much more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. More than the air. Than the song I sing, and more than the next I feel, more than anything in Lord as time goes by, and I will be by your side, and I never want to go back to my old life. I need you more.
to